Welcome back to another video here on the Madvid Pro AI YouTube channel. Today I'm going to go over all of the recent developments in the AI world that caught my eye, specifically the stuff that I was the most excited about and interested in. Let's kick this off here. ChatGPT has a brand new feature that I think is both really good but not quite as well implemented as I'd hoped. As you can see, you can now bring GPTs into any conversation in ChatGPT, so you just type the at button and then you can just bring any GPT you want into your current conversation. This allows you to add relevant GPTs with the full context of the conversation at hand. And full context of the conversation is both true and false at the same time. Let me give you an example. Here's how this works. Here we are in GPT-4. Well, ask a simple question. What other creatures are snails most related to? A completely random question that can be verified with science. ChatGPT produces an answer in its traditional way without doing any research from Bing, without pulling up any articles like a custom GPT might be able to, just based off of its knowledge base. And this is a pretty simple question so we can assume this is right but let's say you know we want to verify this I can do the at button right here and I can at any GPT that I want into this conversation so this includes first and foremost all of the recent GPTs that I might have talked to but also any of the ones that I have pinned before so the obvious one to go for here is consensus which is the AI research assistant that has 200 million academic papers from consensus so we'll at consensus here and we'll say verify this information. You'll see consensus does its action here. It pulls up its various studies that are actual real studies that can be linked to, not just information that the AI is telling us, you know, something that can actually be cited as a real scientific source. And in this very simple context, it works quite well. You'll notice here, I do have to be careful if I want to send my other message to just regular chat GPT, it defaults to consensus now. So I have to click this X button and now I'll just talk to chat GPT. I'll go see chat GPT. You are correct. Consensus verified your sources. And now I am back to chatting with ChatGPT. And of course, this chat is not just limited to consensus now. I can go ahead and add pretty much any of these that I want, like comic book image creator, and say, make me a comic about this chat. As you can see, it did an all right job with this, but um, AI image generation isn't quite there to replicate this. Anyways, as much as all of these GPTs are separate from each other, the context here is that consensus is not the separate GPT. It is still a part of chat GPT. So in the AI's mind, these two are not separate. I believe you can manipulate the context of the conversation to allow them to believe it is so, but I'm going to go ahead and do another test here to show you that by default, it's going to see this GPT as a part of itself. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in something called Riz GPT. It's a dating buddy, and the reason I'm bringing in this GPT is because it is very different from your typical GPT-4. How do I Riz up the feral cat I found outside? Okay, so it gives us this response. Now I am going to exit out of talking to this GPT, and I'll simply ask, what did you just tell me? ChatGPT in this case thinks that it is this, and this is the response that it gave it. So it says, I apologize for any confusion, and then it gives you a very typical ChatGPT-esque answer. However, if I assign the correct context of the situation and let it know that it just was a different GPT, it will respond correctly. And now it seems to accept the context that I gave it that we heard from this separate GPT first, and now we're hearing from the OG ChatGPT. This isn't really a huge issue in most typical productivity use use cases, it would work out fine, but I wish the context was there from the start that I am bringing in a separate GPT and that this GPT is separate from this one and so on and so forth. One other thing that you can't quite do yet that I would really like to see is be able to add more than one GPT at a time. As you can see, if I just kind of spam these things, it'll just bring them up and they don't stack. So I can't add multiple GPTs at once as cool as that would be not possible. I'd have to do one after another after another in separate chats. And here is the other quarrel that I have with this new system. As you can see, we have a search bar here for recent and pinned GPTs, but that's it. I'd love to be able to search GPTs that are in the wide store, not just recent ones and pinned ones. Like, let's say I wanted to pull up a GPT that was very sophisticated in this area, or knows all about this specific technology or something like that. I might not have that readily pinned, but I know in the context at the moment that I need it. So I wish I was able to just 
just search for that immediately. The easiest thing to do right now, I would say, is to try to estimate what you might need. Like if you do a lot of schoolwork and you learn through school by using AI, you can click on any one of these, like Scholar AI. I've started a new chat, but I haven't used up any of my GPT-4 messages with it, so I just go up to the top corner over here and then click keep in sidebar and just pin it without actually sending it a message. I'd love to be able to like right click on these perhaps or maybe like a three dots over here to just pin random ones that I see over here or even pin them from search. So again, you know, it's just about making it a little bit easier to use. That's that's kind of what I'm seeing with this. Either way, it still is really cool and I love where OpenAI's head is at with it. Like I can go right into write for me, for example. I'll tell it to write me an engaging and unique story. Our story is written. I can now do another at and I'll go ahead and add at diagrams show me which is a fantastic GPT take this story create a diagram that explores its ideas visually and you can see it did something really cool here it took all of the ideas and themes from this piece of text that we just generated and actually visually displays it for us it's a great feature Again, just a few quarrels that I have with it. Going back to that Twitter post, as Rowan Chung here on Twitter no doubt points out, ChatGPT is slowly becoming the hub for AI agents working together. And that, to me, is the most exciting part, looking towards the future. You can see some GPTs are even taking advantage of this, adding specific hotkeys when you add it. Pretty awesome stuff. Here's something I also wanted to mention to you guys, Meta AI released Code Llama 70B, which is a more performant version of their other LLM for code generation. What's great about this is it's available under the same exact licenses as previous Code Llama models. It's one of the best code LLMs we've ever seen to date. They have it for Instruct and Python. As the second tweet down here points out, it is the most performant base model for fine tuning code generation, so they're excited to see what the community can actually build in terms of more fine-tuned models based on this code generation large language model. Code is how we interact with computers, so there is no doubt in my mind that the fact that this is open source makes it absolutely massive, and it's only because it's open source. If you do want to access it, however, it's not just a download right on the website, you do have to kind of fill out all this information, and it's given at their discretion. Obviously, that's a, a sort of a safety thing going on here. Either way, Meta is one of the only large AI-focused companies right now that's really putting out quality open source work. So I have to give them props here for this. Code is the language that computers speak and computers are so integral into our lives today. So the fact that we are going to have better AI coding in the future is going to help break down those barriers, especially because it's open source. And hopefully anyone will be able to develop whatever they want for a computer without having all of that necessary knowledge of coding. That's sort of the idea behind this. Here is another little piece that caught my eye. This is FemaNet, flow-guided dynamic filtering and iterative feature refinement with multi-attention for joint video super resolution and deblurring. Oh my god, that was a mouthful. But it is really cool. So this is essentially video enhancement. Not only are we increasing the resolution of videos, but we're actually de-blurring them. As you can see with this video, here's the before zoomed, blurry, low-resolution photo. There's a lot of motion blur here. It's not a very clear video and when, when the camera moves rapidly we can't see people's individual faces and on top of that it's it's just a low resolution video here it is with the fema net results i mean this is absolutely staggering not only are we getting at least twice the resolution it looks really good quite clear there's a little bit of flowiness i think in the finer details there but it definitely looks a lot better and i prefer it over the blurry one that's for sure and the big part here is the motion blur is almost entirely solved and this was extremely shocking to me. This works so crazy well. Like, there's the blurry, there's the not blurry. In some artistic cases, you definitely want some motion blur, but I mean, this is just on another level and definitely enables some capabilities in terms of videography that we just haven't seen before. We'll take this as an example right here. You can see the camera. If I move my hands, there's some motion blur there. If I increase the camera's sensitivity to light, making my face a lot more bright, I can then go ahead and up 
the shutter speed, which essentially removes that blur, as you can see, or some of that blur. If I move around, it's a lot more like that FemaNet result. So yes, this is a result you can achieve manually with cameras, but it actually comes at a inherent trade-off inside of the camera, which is increasing the camera's sensitivity to light. Take, for example, slow motion video. To achieve good slow motion video, we need to capture many frames per second, many more than you typically would see in this YouTube video, for example. This requires a much higher shutter speed and also typically will lower the the resolution because of the processing capabilities of the camera. So, you know, for this example, this looks all right, but this is an at-home method for capturing slow motion. It's a little bit low resolution, so by using this new AI method, we could take even older slow motion technologies and potentially upscale not only the resolution of the video itself, but the apparent shutter speed as well, giving us cleaner slow motion footage, which I just personally find super interesting. Anyways, yeah, they have some examples. This one doesn't really show the motion blur and just the upscaling a little bit more clearly. It is really, really quite good upscaling for video, although we've had decent video upscaling for quite some time now. This one definitely shows that motion capabilities a lot more as well. It's, it's pretty insane how it's able to just clear everything up and just sharpen it all up. It's absolutely magical. Here, you'll be able to see it with the examples of the cars in this scenario right here. Quite blurry and then immediately sharp, although you can see the wheels are not perfect by any means. You can see they even make some examples here showing you how close they were able to get to reality with this stuff. Obviously, FemaNet down there is theirs and then GT is real life. In contrast to the others, FemaNet is by far the most accurate to producing legible text or good looking wheels. I would love to see this implemented into actual camera technology, perhaps even your phone in the future to allow you to capture super slow motion video at high resolutions and with good shutter speeds. This one's more of a tidbit than anything else, but this is from Carlos E. Perez on Twitter, pointing out LLMs are lying, apparently have a recognizable signature in their brain activity, their so-called neural activity. You can see that the token position between layers is actually much different for honest neural activity versus knowingly dishonest neural activity. To me, this just proves that while large language models, sure, they are computers, they have more similarities to our own brains than you might think at first. Now, yeah, in the replies to this tweet, there are some good points about what does this actually mean. Large language models don't lie or tell the truth. They make sentences based on probabilistic models they have been trained on. To me, this just kind of points out that everything is truly perspective based here. Truth versus lying is absolutely more subjective than we truly think it is a lot of the time. So this was also pretty crazy. This is Morpheus-1, the world's first multimodal generative ultrasonic transformer designed to induce and stabilize lucid dreams, which is like actually really, really cool. I can see this coming out in the form of a product you can wear to bed that actually gives you lucid dreams instead of training yourself to do it first. For those of you who might not be familiar, a lucid dream basically is you're dreaming, but you know you're dreaming and thus can control your actions, relatively speaking, inside of your dream. Some people do it naturally. You can absolutely train yourself to do it as well. Personally, I've both trained myself and have experienced it naturally, and it's definitely an experience that I think is worth your time. So the fact that we can train an AI model to actually induce such a state in your brain is pretty insane and shows you how much the brain can actually be affected by outside sources, even just physical ones, not ones that are intaked by your senses. This thread is actually really, really great. It explains this whole thing really simply. Unlike large language models, Morpheus 1 is not prompted with words and sentences, but rather brain states. And instead of generating words, it generates ultrasonic holograms for neurostimulation to bring one to a lucid state at any point. Yeah, this is some real <laughs> science fiction stuff. I mean, seriously, what else could this be used for other than lucid dreaming? Can I put a hat on that immediately will connect me to someone else's brain?
brainwaves and we can share thoughts? I mean, is that the future that we are arriving to or what? Because that's the, the first thing that came to my mind. Sending images with our minds, potentially wearing helmets that can stimulate our brains in such a way it actually increases our cognitive abilities, makes us more intelligent. I mean, how far, how deep does this truly go? Because the future is going to be wild. So yeah, anyways, that's how it is actually inducing the lucid dreams. It's trained on people's brainwaves. It knows what lucid looks like and can actually send some ultrasonic waves to stimulate your brain and make it lucid while you're already asleep. Scarily enough, it wasn't even that hard to train. <laughs> 101 million parameter model, which for models is pretty small, trained on only eight GPUs for two days. Large language models take way longer to train. So you can check out the rest of the thread if you want to learn a little bit more, but here's the kicker about all of this. Our beta program starts this spring. Sign up here and become one of the first to step foot in the dream world. Are you kidding me? Okay, so it's gonna be a real thing. We can give humanity the tools to explore and expand consciousness. Oh my gosh, this is just absolutely nuts. I'm gonna sign up for this, but this is like totally that, that future stuff that, that scares people, and I totally get it. It's scary, but it's real. It's coming and it's here. The future is not what we expect it to be. So yeah, guys, that's everything that kind of made me take a step back go, whoa, okay, this, this is pretty mind-blowing stuff. I've been really, really specific about what I've been filtering out and covering on this channel lately, because I only want to talk about stuff that I'm truly passionate about. I would like to say though, thank you so much for watching and continuing to support the Matt Vid Pro AI channel. Let me know in the comments if there's anything specific you'd like me to check out, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.